Hello and welcome to lecture 7. Uh, in this video I will be summarizing uh, the idea of syllogisms. Um, this is a crucial part of the formal aspect of this logic course. Uh, so if we can turn to page 215 uh, to the section on syllogisms. Uh, in this video, I'll, I'll just make a brief uh, summary of what syllogisms are, their technical points, and then more importantly, get on to the, some of the interesting criticisms of syllogisms. Uh, okay, so the in terms of the, the structure of a syllogism, there's a three-part structure uh, that can be exemplified in the following example that we often give. All men are mortal, and Socrates is a man, Therefore, Socrates is mortal. Okay, so there are three. What you can see from this is that there are three propositions, two premises, and one conclusion. There are three terms, and each term is used twice. The subject of the conclusion is called the minor term. The predicate of the conclusion is called the major term. Uh, the term which appears in each premise, but not in a conclusion is called the middle term. Uh, the premise containing the major term is called the minor premise and the premise containing the minor term is called the major premise. Okay, so um, it, it, this, 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 this structure, it, it may sound a, a, a bit dry, but I think it's, it's time, I think it's really worth it to, to really just go over um, the, 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 the Socrates syllogism, the, 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 three, the, the three line syllogism, and just see if you can identify your, yourself these uh, aspects, the, the major term, the minor term, the major premise, the minor premise, and just really see, uh, pick these, these, these structural components, these, these axioms out of, of this syllogism yourself. And that way you'll get a better sense of um, the structure, the architecture of, of syllogism. Okay, so that's, that's basically what a syllogism is. Um, however, we turn to page 219, we can see the objection to it. Firstly, the important, the, the, the skeptics ob objection to it. So the syllogism was a wonderful tool that was used in early philosophy. Um, you know, really up until the beginning of the, the, the scientific revolution. It was, made, it was a major tool that provided a basis for reasoning right throughout the medieval period um, and through into the early modern period. Uh, okay, so, and, so there were objections to this quite early on. Um, however, yeah, uh, and these became increasingly important important as throughout the centuries um, uh, the the classic objection is the skeptics objection to the syllogism like the ancient skeptics argued that every syllogism rests upon uh, unproven prem premises uh, these need to be proved by other syllogisms which in turn rest on unproven uh, premises etc etc ad infinitum uh, this this point was was made by a, a famous German philosopher nineteenth century called Jakob Fries who uh, he came up with what was regarded as a Friesian dilemma, that is, um, you know, where do we start? Uh, I mean, we start with with an unproven premise. Um, uh, such as, no no mortals are gods. Or computers are machines. No men are insects. Whatever, whatever you want, um, and it, and this is the this is the problem with syllogisms that the first premise is 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 it's not um, proven in ever, any way. It's 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 it's, it's, take, it's assumed. So we have a problem here that we either accept it dogmatically. This was choice one for Jakob Fries, um, or we we find. <laughs> We have recourse to an earlier syllogism or earlier um, set of reasoning to try and justify uh, this earlier explanation. Um, so no mortals are gods. Okay, what are mortals? 
then we need to ha we need we need something to prove what are mortals and God what are gods. We need something to prove what are gods, and then we need something to prove that explanation. So there's kind of an infinite regress there here. So we have one either dogmatic take, you know, just don't inquire uh, too deeply into in, into um, uh, the, the unproven premises to infinite regress. Or three, kind of, he, he, he had an idea of some sort of, I won't go into this, but some sort of, what he called psychologism, which was, um, you know, so, uh, a, a bit of a fuzzy sort of third or alternative related um, to, to perceptions, intuitions, that sort of thing. Um, ne neither was, neither option he found was, um, was satisfactory. So yeah, but the main two are, um, do, do we take the starting point of the syllogism at face value as unproven, that what Popper called dogmatic assumption, or do we, you know, allow in for a, a potential infinite regress of explanation? You know, like a, a, a child, when you, when, when my, my three-year-old asks, you know, ask a question, and they give him an answer, then he says, why? Then they answer that question, he says, why again? And he, I, I answer that, and he says, why? And it, I mean, it, it gets very frustrating, but that's there's the, 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 the something in that logic to the, the problem of syllogisms, um, finding an ultimate explanation for the, the first premise, the premises um, is, is, is just uh, not, not possible within this, within this particular structure. Okay, so um, that's the okay. There's that issue. Um, I, I like to mention three laws relating to syllogism, which are crucial. They're on page two twenty. Uh, first, the law of contra non contradiction uh, can be formulated in various ways. Aristotle formulated it in a, as. Um, uh, the same property cannot both belong and not belong to the same subject at the same time in the same respect. A tree cannot be at the same time taller than a cat and not taller than a cat. Aristotle's formulation is in terms of the relation between the two terms, subject and predicate, of, of a simple proposition. Uh, in modern symbolic logic, this rendered as if P is true, then P is not false. Or no proposition can be true and false uh, at the same time. Okay. So um, in terms of real beings, nothing can both be and not be. Uh, in, term, in terms of terms, it states that S cannot both be p and not both be p and not p uh, in terms of propositions it states that a proposition p cannot be both true and false uh, okay yep so the general formulation for this is x uh, x is not is not non x uh, okay so the second law, so that's the law of non-contradiction. Um, the second law is the law of identity, which states that X is X. In terms of real beings, uh, whatever is, is. Um, in terms of terms, whatever is X, is X. In terms of propositions, if P is true, P is true. So law of non-contradiction, law of identity. And the final one is the law of the excluded middle. Um, it says either uh, X or non X. In terms of real beings, everything must either be or not be. In terms, in terms of terms, S must be either P or not P. In terms of propositions, either P or not P. Every proposition must either must be either true or false. Um, Okay, so these are the three rules. I think the final one's quite interesting, law of the excluded middle. Um, Graham Priest, for instance, a, a, a great logician in Melbourne, um, is doing some interesting work on, on coming up with uh, a logic that, that doesn't, um, this, which av av avoids this. Uh, um, 
th uh, this and, and has um, uh, uh, other options available to it. So the other the other logics that uh, that do break these laws and that um, do can do really interesting things with it. This was a huge part of early twentieth century logic as well. Um, uh, coming up with other logics that don't obey these laws but for the for this course um, we'll, we'll just keep uh, uh, our focus on you know the these particular laws which are crucial to the syllogism and crucial to to the Aristotelian logic and formal logic in in the the, the standard um, conventional way um, that it's construed okay so how about the empiricist objection to to logic? We can see that on page two 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 three. Um, this links nicely with the work we've been doing um, in in the uh, uh, well in the other course that you'll do next semester on um, enlightenment philosophy uh, of of philosophy of science. Um, so. The empiric, you know how we how we mentioned before how l logic is often seen as and the the laws of logic and causality of logic is, is seen as not being related to the natural world and, and and causality in nature. Well, the empiricists picked up on this and they saw that they had an objection to uh, the syllogism regarding it as fake. Um, uh, that it, it it claims to yield new knowledge. But it in fact doesn't yield any new knowledge. Um, so, if there is no more in the conclusion than there is in the premise, the syllogism is a tautology. Um, so, the syllogism, what they're arguing is, is really an, an elaborate form of tautology. And if there is, then it is a non sequitur. Thus, the syllogism is either a trivial tautology or an invalid non sequitur. So neither of these options are very good. Um, it's, e it's, e it's either invalid or it doesn't yield any new information. Either way, the, the, um, the, the empiricist criticism of the syllogism is pretty damning. Um, and we see this, uh, this, this uh, really come to the fore in, in Bacon's great work, The New Method, um, uh, which we, we also look at in Philosophy of Science. Um, in that he tries to provide a new mode of induction. Induction was already around before Bacon, but he tries to provide a new, a new method, uh, one that will replace um, what he <laughs> uh, regards as a really dishonest scientific method that preceded um, his method. That is the 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 method of Aristotelian syllog syllogistic deduction. Um, so, so, so Bacon's inductivism, or method of induction, uh, aimed to to uh, to provide an alternative um, view of reasoning. Um, you know, it, it it was great. It was, I mean, it, it did the job. It, it it sort of played a crucial role in launching the scientific revolution. So Bacon was onto it. Um, however, why we. <laughs> The reason why we're still learning about syllogisms and Aristotelian logic uh, now right into 2020 in the middle of a global pandemic, um, you know, in the middle of, uh, of, 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 a, of, a, of a plague, you know, almost reading Aristotle, you know, studying Thomistic logic, we're almost back in the Middle Ages here um, in a strange sort of ways. But, the reason why we do this is because later after Bacon, another famous philosopher that we, we look at in other courses called Hume came along. And Hume, basically, he, he also demolished induction, inductivism. He, he, he basically created a very simple justification for why um, induction doesn't work and why it's grounded on un, you know, unfounded assumptions itself. 
and you know the, the the main his main Hume's main argument was if you see a white swan and then you assume more swans in the future will be white, um, you know that that's the way induction generally works. You make generalizations from from particular ob observed instances to to universal laws. So whether you saw you've seen one swan, ten swans, a hundred, a thousand, a million. And then you make the inductive inference, the generalization, the leap to the fact that all swans are indeed white. That's inductive inference, method following Bacon. Um, and then one day you, you, you arrive in Western Australia and find a black swan. Um, uh, that throws out the, your whole law, the whole model. You can see how ineff inefficient induction is in that sense. Um, it also raises problems too about uh, it, its efficacy and, and the assumptions that build into induction. One, that the future will be like the past. Um, the ma that's the main one. You know, the future is never like the past. Who could have predicted last year, 2019, that 2020 would be like this? And people like me would be sitting in at home at night <laughs> running running classes rather than face to face um, the future indeed is not like the past despite um, despite sort of uh, instances of recurrence that lead us to to, 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 to have the psychological feel that um, you know there is repetition and we can make generalizations well we can but you know they're easily refuted. Something radically new comes along in the future. So that's Hume's criticism of 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 induction. It's a bit of a side issue, but it, it just shows that. Well, the point I'm trying to make is that um, despite all the criticisms of inductive syllogism, it, it's it's you know it's still one of the, the you know our, our main our main tools of reasoning that we have. It's still uh, uh, absolutely crucial for the the history of, of the understanding the development of Western rationality and ration, rationality generally and reasoning and good clear thinking uh, that in many ways is, it has strengths over its best alternative which is induction um, so uh, so yeah you, you can uh, you could ignore Aristotle and St. Thomas Aquinas at your peril. Um, so, yeah, so, the, so I think that's, I mean, that's all for, for this video. If I, if I keep it going any longer, then it's going to take forever to upload. Um, and um, keep tuned for, for further, further videos. Um, on the lecture themes. Thank you.